Hey, welcome to London 360, the news feature show which keeps you in the know about everything that's been happening in the capital. You can catch us here on air or you can watch the show anytime online at communitychannel.org forward slash London360 and get involved and keep up with the action behind the scenes by following us on social media. Don't go anywhere because coming up we've got some important and glitzy stories from women living in poverty with the willpower to change society to a night celebrating British talent in film and television. African communities have had a huge cultural impact in London, from fashion to food and music. Since its origins, the Afrobeat music scene is evolving fast onto some of the capital's mainstream playlists. Reconnecting with their heritage, British Africans are reinventing the sound. Lape Banjo went to check out how. The one thing that we can't deny now is entertainment is the new oil. That is the new business for Africa. My humble father, Sinaji. My loving daughter, Sinaji Mo. My baby mama, Sinaji. Tele Momodu. Afrobeat music has contributed majorly to Africa and Africans in the diaspora, with global live Afrobeat performances and album sales generating a total of £96 million in 2008. Well, here in the UK, it's been um, it's it's just been phenomenal. You have artists coming here and selling out venues such as uh, Brixton Academy, which is a capacity of 5,000 people. And you had uh, there was a show a few years ago with David O and Tiwa Savage, both kind of leaders in the Afrobeat sound, and they completely sell out that venue. As a result of its popularity, various Afrobeat events have sprung up across London, which is uniting the African community. At the bi-weekly Afrobeats karaoke, African Londoners are gathered here today to enjoy a night of cultural music with a hint of London. So we've got, okay, we've got hip hop karaoke, you've got Ray karaoke, but there's never been an Afrobeat karaoke. Anywhere can happen Afrobeats karaoke, and there should be more everywhere. Um, the moment I heard about this, I was like, what? This is something that we actually need. Even if you're non-African, it's just, it's fun, it's vibrant, it's very cultural, but yeah, it's, it's generally open to anyone. Since its inception, one area of change that has positively impacted the scene is the quality of the sound and live performances. The composers are a live band that incorporate popular Afrobeat hits into their shows. Funky House, you know, comes from Garage, and it wasn't really an African thing, it was a UK thing, but a lot of black people were involved in it. You know, then the Funky House had a kind of Afro feel to it, because it was a kind of a tribal kind of feel with like Garage or with like Jungle and Drum and Bass. And then the Africans just took over. You know, the Caribbeans took Bashman and then we took the funk house and took it to like the Afrobeats. Although the Afrobeat sound maintains its African origin, the audience and listenership is varied. British born Vietnamese DJ Lep Tizzle has been specializing in Afrobeat music for a decade. He shed light on the variations of Afrobeat music in London. I mean, it's still predominantly African Afrobeats, but the rise of British Afrobeats now, like the UK stuff, it's, it's rising, the quality um, is, is, is getting there, it's, getting there. it's, it's catching up slowly to, to the African stuff and a couple things are coming through, I mean not everything is going to be a hit, that's just music, but more tunes are coming through now and we've got more talent coming from the UK, the likes of Logo, the likes of uh, Mr Silva and uh, Palms and Flavour. I think UK Afrobeats is two cultures coming together, but the predominant culture is definitely the African culture, but then you've got the coolness and the swagginess of like the UK or whatever, the European culture, and you bring it together and just make it really cool. I think it's great that they're all waving the flag and really creating this UK African sound, uh, which is, is, is doing really, they're all doing really, really well. It's wonderful. I see more collaborations with mainstream artists and our African artists originating from Africa. We have the likes of Drake working with Wizkid. Like, it's, it's going to be more of that. Beyonce is going to work with somebody. Just wait for it. We're waiting. We live in a very vibrant and wealthy city, attracting thousands of shoppers to the heart of London every day. 
But the gap between the rich and the poor was recently demonstrated with protests in front of Topshop, finding the two worlds colliding against each other. Now with further recent cuts of benefits, the fight for equality doesn't just stop there. But now Felix caught up with protesters fighting for their rights. Inequality in London is on the rise. With the gap between rich and poor increasing, many have called for reforms from both the government and the commercial sector. Outside Topshop's main branch on Oxford Street, protesters called for the cleaning and floor staff to be paid a fair income. We've pulled off this rowdy demonstration here. We've managed to close the shop for about half an hour now. And, uh, you know, we'll be back as many times as it takes, really, until Topshop does the right thing and pays all its workers the real London living wage of £9.40 per hour. We asked Susanna, a cleaner at Topshop, why she was risking her job to support the protest. Topshop has hired a cleaning company which doesn't respect us people and who doesn't value us. We've got the same rights and needs as everyone else. We need a living wage to lead a dignified life. In response to demands for better pay, Topshop offered £7.50 per hour, 30p above the newly introduced national living wage. The cleaners explained why they rejected the offer. Those people probably lead a very comfortable life if they hold opinions like that. Uh, people have got a right to uh, live and work in dignity and to earn a decent wage while they do it. End of story. Arcadia gave us this statement. At Arcadia, we value and appreciate our staff and are proud of the contribution they make to our business. In the interests of transparency and in response to some factually incorrect allegations made by United Voices of the World, we wish to confirm that all our employees are paid hourly rates which are legally compliant. In central London, we currently pay rates well above the UK government's national minimum wage. For us, it is essential to remain competitive and in line with other major retailers to attract, grow and retain the best people. Philip Green, the chairman of Arcadia Group, has also been accused of not paying his fair share of tax. Arcadia is owned by his wife, who is based in Monaco. These are very rich people that use these tax havens, who are obviously threatening everything they can to try and keep the sort of sweet tax arrangements that they have. If you travel along the central line, you go through the city of London where life expectancy is 89 years and you get to Whitechapel where it's 76 years. It's actually about poorer people living shorter, unhealthier, unhappier lives and that's why it's such a scandal. With recent controversy over George Osborne's budget and the proposed cuts to welfare, we spoke to disabled activists on how they believe the government's austerity has created a more unequal society. They've widened the poverty gap enormously. The effect on disabled people in the UK has been catastrophic, which is laughably immoral. You know, what kind of country are we living in where these things are happening? The things have gone so beyond the pale, it's just out of control. The abolition of disability living allowance and being replaced by personal independence payments and those represent a loss of over two billion pounds to disabled people because it has a much harsher test. The system essentially where one percent of the population has managed to not only monopolize the wealth but to use that wealth to buy political power to create even more wealth and it's a vicious circle that, that we have to break. They're, they're not removing the debt, they're shoving the debt onto the weak and vulnerable. Despite these challenges, inequality can be beaten. We need to make sure that we're getting the right investment in the sorts of the things that everybody needs just to have a fair start in life, so good schools, good hospitals. If we had some kind of agenda like that and it was followed through, we could do quite a lot to close the gap between the rich and the poor. There are so many people left at the bottom that are going without. If we don't come and do something about this, we have nothing left to fight for. You've already taken everything, so we have to be here doing this now. Here at London 360, we love to give people a platform to have a say about their amazing city. So we invite you to send us your stories, points of view or even passionate friends. Javier Canaval Saavedra from Southwark tells us why bilingual Londoners should make the most of their second language. Take it away, Javier. Hi, I'm Javier and I'm from Southwark and I'm here to tell you bilinguals why you need to get qualified. Because despite the fact that London speaks over 250 languages, 75% of Brits can't have a conversation in a foreign language. This is terrible because regardless of whether we leave or stay in the EU, we're still going to need to connect and communicate with the rest of the world. And in London, we speak Spanish, Urdu, Yoruba, Polish, Russian, Arabic. All of these languages are the languages of the future. So if you speak that language, get qualified, get an A-level, get a GCSE, 
because it's easy and it's gonna help you be more employable in the future. So it's a no-brainer, so just do it. It helps me. I speak Spanish, I have Spanish GCSE. I did it in 10 minutes. Not literally, but that's beside the point. Get qualified, do it, because if I can do it, you can too. Thank you, Javier. Or should I say, obrigada, Javier. Now, coming up after the break, we have an exciting red carpet event featuring an award-winning actor from Star Wars who was born and raised in Peckham. Then we visit a home that had two world-class music legends living in it. Want to know who? Stay tuned to find out more. Welcome back to part two of London 360, bringing you real and alternative stories from London's hidden communities. London has been home to many famous musicians from across the world over the centuries. One London street has had two well-known artists living on the same site for almost 240 years apart. Discovering some chilling and amusing facts, Savan Gandetcher uncovers their story. London has been home to many famous musicians such as The Who and The Beatles. But did you know that Jimi Hendrix and composer George Handel lived almost 240 years apart? The Handel and Hendrix in London Museum is located on Brook Street where both musicians lived. For an entry fee of £10 for adults and £5 for children, you can travel back in time and explore two very different periods. Handel was born in Saxony, which is now part of Germany, and came to London in around 1710. He moved into this house in 1723 and lived here for the rest of his life and died in this room in 1759. Jimi Hendrix came to London first in 1967, became an enormous hit really quickly, went back to America for a brief time and then came to London and came into the flat here in Brook Street in 1968 and lived here for about six months. Handel would appreciate that we've kind of kept his rooms as they would have been and we're kind of um, trying to promote his music as well. And the same with Hendrix, I think he would have, I think he would have found it hilarious that we've kept this exactly as it would have been. But also I think he would have appreciated that his music is still being appreciated by other people and it's really kind of still spreading. There are a couple of striking similarities between them. First of all, they're both immigrants to London. This is really important. They both arrive in London in their different centuries, uh, moments where London is becoming a musical centre of their world, really. So both of them arrive in London. London has a certain musical scene, but they kind of grab that by the throat and really shake it up and make something completely new. Handel paid £35 per year to live here and Hendrix paid £30 per week. Just that comparison with today's London renting prices is just incredible. And the fact that they lived side by side for quite a similar amount of money, but for different time frames is just really, really great. For Handel and Hendrix, it's an ideal location because both of them were within walking distance of where they worked. And wouldn't we all love to live in Mayfair and walk to work? Whilst exploring the museum, you may feel a ghostly presence. The story goes that he was shaving in his bathroom on the top floor one morning and over his shoulder reflected in the mirror he says he saw a man with an old wig on uh, kind of walking around behind him and he thought that was Handel's ghost. He went downstairs and told Cathy Etchingham, his girlfriend, about it and she was sort of like, oh, all right, Handel's ghost kind of thing. But I think the point is he was really interested in Handel and Handel's music because they're both great innovators and I think they'd be quite interested in what each other had done to innovate their type of music. Of course when Handel lived here it wasn't the heart of London at all, it was on the very fringes of London and this whole area was a brand new development, he was the first person to live in this house but this was the western expansion of London that happened after the Great Fire of London, it took a while to develop but it was kind of like a planned space as well with the great Georgian squares at either end of Brook Street here linking them. When Hendrix was living at 23 Brook Street, he thought he was living in Handel's house and he was really interested in that link. So he would be really active in looking for his music. So he bought uh, Handel's Messiah and Belshazzar on LP and listened to them. He was very interested in that. The museum is open every day and is a place where both their music is played together in harmony. So check out this alternative venue in the heart of the West End. 
The current refugee crisis and gender equality issues are global topics of debate. In fact, in our last show, we covered stories in these areas. The discussion of gender equalities is even more neglected when it comes to migrant and refugee women. Two events in London demonstrated the challenges that they face today. Here in this city, the refugees and asylum seekers leading lives of misery. Two events in London highlighted some of the unjust treatment migrants and refugees face today. One was the Stand Up to Racism rally with 20,000 people and the other was the Women on the Move award ceremony at Southbank's Women of the World Festival. All the women who are nominated are actually already winners to some extent because somebody around them has noticed that they're doing something really special. So that makes a huge difference for these women to be recognized on this really privileged space in front of 600 people. I left Somalia because my tribe is a minority tribe which was fighting with other major tribes. Women were being raped and men were being killed. So all that was going on, so it was depressing me a lot and I felt I was a victim because I had children out of wedlock. I think refugees I and asylum seekers face challenges here in London. Challenges about housing, challenges about getting their status regularised and also problems with harassment. Where I live in Cambridge recently, a refugee uh, was racially abused while her child was playing on a swing. The system for deciding who gets refugee status don't take account of the persecution experienced by women because of their gender. And for that reason, many more claims from women are rejected than should be. The Women on the Move Awards is my favorite event of the year because it celebrates the achievement of migrant and refugee women in the UK. I have won an award for the work that I do. And I am, the English say overwhelmed. I have had a breakthrough and I want to do better for women who cannot speak up for themselves. In future, I want to help a lot of people and I want to become a doctor. This award has meant a lot for me as a refugee and for helping other refugees. Any opportunity to celebrate, embrace and ensure that women are being given an opportunity to showcase themselves, we need more of that. So we've built this network of 87 groups across the country. Overwhelmingly, they're led by women. There's a generation of women that have stepped up to this global crisis and said, we can and will do something about it. Um, and that's really exciting. Women on the Move is having a positive impact on individuals and communities. Yet demonstrators still feel that more needs to be done to take notice of migrants and refugees. This uh, beautiful uh, demonstration today is a huge one and this shows the sign of people getting more to know about refugees and more support we, they are gaining. This is why the government should take this into consideration and try to put more efforts and more action to help these refugees. Our press should look at both sides of the story. We should realise that People are drowning in the sea, and it's not because they want to come and have an easy life in, in London, it's because they're desperate to get away from what they're facing. Although this year's Oscar and BAFTA awards were dominated by So White hashtags, a ceremony in London in its 11th year balanced things out. The Screen Nation Awards celebrates the best talent from black British film and television in this past year and what a big impact they've had. Laurel Campbell joined the stars at the ceremony. In the absence of diversity in mainstream award ceremonies, it's really important that something like Screen Nation has come along and has filled the huge gap. Founded by Charles Thompson MBE, Screen Nation hosted its 11th annual Film and Television Awards. The ceremony honours and showcases the achievements of black professionals within the film and television industry. With black people I think we're more versatile than people expect. We like to be expressionate. For example when I was coming up you were just a singer, but I want to act. I want to do something a little bit more, I want to do charity work, I want to, be, I want to get into tech. I really wanted to be on TV and to do things and there weren't a lot of people that, what was it, it was like Floella Benjamin, 
pearly gates, Carmen Monroe, who we're celebrating tonight. To restrict someone by their colour, shouldn't that really happen? Ken Hom was Chinese and so he had to cook Chinese food. I'm a black man so I had to cook West Indian food. I thought, well hold on a minute, I've trained as a French cuisine chef. So therefore, you know, I can cook French food, I can cook Italian food, Malaysian food, you name it. It's how you're combining those flavours and whether people enjoy it or not. The Oscars, there weren't ha hardly, well there was no black people was there at all. So it's quite nice having these Screen Nation Awards where it's all about black people. It's embracing black people. I think it's brilliant. Now we can put black people on the screen and it doesn't offend anybody, doesn't offend anybody's sensibilities. Years ago we had, the, we had you know, uh, programmes like the Desmonds. We don't have that anymore. I never felt I was represented on screen, not accurately anyway. It was either some urban thug, uh, which that wasn't me, or someone that had a scholarship to go and play football. Good to see on screen what some of us see every single day and every single moment of our lives on the streets that we live in and the offices that we work in. Uh, it's great to see that reflected uh, on screen so that can only ever be a good thing. We have a legacy of great talent, we have a legacy of a pool of, you know, of a community that is thriving, we've got a legacy of amazing people that came before us. As well as celebrating achievements, attendees commented on what more needs to be done. I don't think that we come together enough to work together to put stuff out there. And if we do come together, we can move forward. We need more black writers, more black producers, more black people in studio positions where the money is, so we can have more black actors coming out and showing what they can do. In any industry you go to, being a young black man is very difficult. I've had people cross the street because whether I want to wear a hood because it's raining, but it's not allowing that to have that at the back of your mind to hold you back. The biggest challenge is, you know, staying in it once you get in it, that perseverance and when you're not getting the roles you want, when you're not doing the jobs that you want to be doing and just staying in it and saying, no, I'm going to graft, I'm going to continue. I'm challenged by the work that I do and I, that's important to me. If I'm not challenged, then I shouldn't be doing it. Be persistent, be artistic and, and explore that and try as much as possible to concentrate on your future. A winner never quits, a quitter never wins. If you truly believe in what you're doing, you're going to see it all the way through. If you're focusing on being undeniable, race doesn't come into it. For me, progress will be made when this is no longer a black award ceremony. It's just an award ceremony and the same faces are still here. That's it for this week. Hope you enjoyed the show. Want to find out more about any of the stories featured? Then go online and search for communitychannel.org forward slash London360. Be sure to like or join in on the conversation and hit us up on social media. And remember, keep it 360.